Welcome everyone to this webinar. I am Lucia Caldeiro. I am the Capacity Building Assistant at the Inter-American Institute for Global Change. I would like to welcome you to this webinar called Benefits of Adaptation and Mitigation in Central America and the Caribbean, the main takeaways of the sixth IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. I would like to remind you that this webinar is being recorded and that we have English-Spanish interpretation. If you wish to uh, listen to a different channel, have a look at the bottom uh, part of your screen. If you would like to introduce yourselves, you can do that in the chat. Tell us where you're from and which country you're from. Now I would like to give the floor to Anna Stewart Ibarra, the IAI Scientific Director. Thank you, Lucia. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to those of you participating in today's event. As the IAI, we are very happy to hold this event. This is the first one of a number of IAI in initiatives that aims to uh, share this valuable information of the sixth IPCC assessment report. We'd like to share this, especially with the Latin American community. This 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 session focuses on Latin America and the Caribbean, and we're very happy to uh, be here with IPCC lead authors. They will be sharing the key takeaways, and um, hopefully we'll have a great debate. You can use the chat function or the Q&A uh, section to add questions. Now I would like to give, sorry, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Mercy Borbro. She's a member of our, our scientific com uh, committee, our council. She's an oceanographer with a PhD in environmental science from the State University of New York. She is a professor at the Escuela Superior Politécnica Litoral, ESPOL Ecuador, and she's a senior researcher at the International Pacific Center for Disaster Risk Reduction. Mercy has been a researcher and public official involved in decision-making processes at the local, regional, and national levels in the areas of environmental management and climate change. She served as Chief of Environmental Control of Guayaquil, was Provincial Director of Disaster Risk Management for Guayas, and Deputy Minister of the Ministry of the Environment of Ecuador. She has actively participated in development of public policies and adaptation to climate change and their implementation at the local level. Her research is transdisciplinary with a focus on socio-ecological systems, spatio-temporal analysis uh, for, or for climate variability and vulnerability, coastal urban systems with an emphasis on the interaction of climate and human health and climate risk reduction. Mercy is lead author for assessment report six, um, AR6 at the mitigation working group uh, of the IPCC, and she's a member of the Human Resources Group for Climate Services, World Meteorological Organization. Thank you very much, Mercy, for moderating this major event. Mercy, you have the floor. Good morning, everyone. Good morning to everyone throughout our region. It's truly a pleasure to be here and sharing this event with all the colleagues from our region and also from the lead authors that will tell us about their, their work experience and about the results of this sixth uh, report and its three chapters, uh, Basic Science, Adaptation and Mitigation. The three IPCC reports have communicate important and urgent actions that need to be implemented in order to um, adapt uh, to the changes and mitigate the, the impacts as well, and also in order to achieve the SDGs. We will try to adopt a systemic perspective in order to address vulnerability impact, and then we'd like to propose the uh, urgent actions that we need to implement um, regarding mitigation, adaptation, and climate resilience in the region. Our first presenter is Dr. Carolina Vera. It's great to introduce her today. She's a lead author of Working Group One, Climate Science and the Impact of Climate Change. She's a, a professor at the School of Sciences at University of Buenos Aires. She's a main researcher at the National Council for Sciences in Argentina. She has been chief of the cabinet of the Minister, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. And she is currently the vice president of the IPCC Bureau Working Group One. She has vast experience in research 
regarding understanding, simulating and forecasting variability in climate change and its impact on socioeconomic sectors such as agriculture. In 2020, she was uh, awarded the Cleveland Air Prize and she has been part of se several international scientific committees. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Carolina Vera. Please, Carolina, you have 10 minutes to make your presentation. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. I uh, would like to thank the IAI. It's great to share this uh, event with my colleagues that also participated in the IPCC. Very briefly, I would like to present some of the main takeaways of the Working Group 1 IPCC report on the physical basis of science climate with a focus on the main changes in the climate conditions that may cause regional impacts. One of the main conclusions of the report is that recent changes in the climate are widespread rapid and they are intensifying. They are also unprecedented in thousands of years. Uh, the slides are in English in order to uh, facilitate the translation. Evidence of this change, have a look at this chart. It shows the evolution of uh, mean global mean temperature anomalies in the last 2000 years uh, on the right. And on the left, you have the information between 1850 and 1900. As you can see, heating is, uh, the warming is unprecedented in more than 2000 years. And actually we are 1.1 degrees higher than in the pre-industrial era. Regard, for instance, CO2 concentration is the highest in at least 2 million years. Um, sea level has risen Sea levels have risen at the fastest rate in at least 3,000 years. And also glaciers retreat. It's uh, completely unprecedented in at least 2,000 years. Another major takeaway, unless we implement immediate, rapid and large-scale large, large scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees will be beyond reach. This report uh, uh, implements five uh, scenarios regarding future emissions. The future additional warming degrees are also analyzed. I will not focus on what the report says about what would happen with emissions, with a carbon budget in the coming decades. I will focus on regional impacts, but I would like you, I would like to invite you to read on these topics uh, uh, in the report. Climate change already affects every region on Earth in multiple ways. The changes we experience will increase with future warming. For the first time in an IPCC report, a general report, the three IPCC working groups have adopted a new common risk framework. We do this to define and assess risk throughout the three chapters. The IPCC describes risk as the potential for adverse consequences for human or ecological systems, recognizing the diversity of values and objectives associated with such systems. In the context of climate change, risks can arise from potential impacts of climate change and from human responses to climate change. Relevant adverse consequences include uh, those on lives, livelihoods, health, uh, economic, social and cultural assets. On the right, you can see the definition uh, of risk we use. 
risk is a combination of hazards, vulnerability conditions, and exposure conditions. So working group one focuses on threats. However, in this report, we did something new. We included another definition, which in English is called climate impact driver. In Spanish, we say condiciones climáticas que pueden dar lugar a impactos. These climatic impact drivers and their changes can actually cause uh, have negative positive consequences or have no consequences at all. So this information we are providing regarding these CIDs or climatic impact drivers can be used more broadly, uh, which is different from just assessing the threats. This is an example. This is a change in the seasonal snow cover faced with an increase that can actually uh, be hazardous for crop planting, but it might be beneficial for skiing resorts, for instance, or it might have no consequences for coastal aquaculture. And that's how we should analyze these CIDs or climatic impact drivers. They have to do with temperature, rain and drought, ice, wind, coastal uh, scenarios, and others that you will find in our report. We have new information on regional impacts, and this is including working group one and working group two. Some of the uh, relevant aspects for this webinar that focuses on Latin America, uh, sorry, on Central America and the Caribbean, because we will focus on Latin America on Thursday. Some major aspects I'd like to share with you. The whole region of Central America and the Caribbean are going through several changes that in some aspects can be generalized, but some belong are, are region specific. For instance, temperature changes mean and extreme temperature changes. These this already shows in several areas that they are higher than the global mean temperatures. And this is because of human action. Also regarding other warming levels, temperature extremes and temperatures are expected to increase in the future. The relative increase of sea levels is expected to increase as well throughout the coast in the region. And it will be connected with an increase in coastal uh, floodings. Also, ocean acidification along coasts, marine heat waves in intensity and duration, they are projected to increase given the increase in warming as well. We also project a strong decline in glaciers, permafrost and snow cover. Uh, regarding tropical cyclones, we will have uh, higher precipitation, the report is quite certain about that. Also, severe storms are expected to become more more extreme. Some distinguishing f distinguishing features in some regions, for instance, in the north of Central America. We anticipate a decrease in NA monsoon precipitation. We already observe an increase in drought, and this is expected to continue in the future. Fire weather is projected to increase as well in the region. In southern Central America, we expect aridity and agricultural and ecological droughts to increase as well. And fire weather is projected to increase as well. In the Caribbean, we can see a declining trend in rainfall during June, July, August. And this will continue in coming decades. We also forecast a higher ev evapotranspiration under a warming uh, climate. And this will result in increased aridity and more severe agricultural and ecological droughts. This report includes an interactive atlas. You can uh, use the atlas and actually um, project information on the climate for the future. The climate we experience in the future depends on our decisions now.
And this is the end of my presentation so that my colleagues can uh, continue speaking about the topic. Thank you so much. That it was an excellent presentation, very brief. So yes, of course, let us now go on to our next colleague in order to have the Q&A session uh, later on. I would like to introduce Dr. Edwin Castellanos. He is a coordinator and lead author of Working Group 2, and he's also director of the Sustainable Economic Observatory, a center of the Research Institute of the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. Until April 2022, uh, he was dean of said research institute. He was also the director of the Center for Environmental and Biodiversity Studies of Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. He holds a PhD in environmental sciences awarded by Indiana University. He has a master's degree in analytical chemistry from Michigan State University. He has participated in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as coordinating lead author in the sixth Global Climate Change Report in the uh, chapter on adaptation and mitigation. His research interests include governance and community management of natural resources, especially forests and water. Dr. Edwin Castellanos, you have the floor. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Please turn on your mic. Thank you. Thank you very much for your introduction, Mercy, and thank you for thank you to the AEI for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here today. As you have already said, I work in working group two that focuses on impact adaptation and vulnerability. So in the next 10 minutes, I would like to give you an overall perspective of what the report mentions for Central America um, in these regards. Uh, we don't have much time, of course. I cannot go into detail, but hopefully the presentation will whet your appetite for the report. The report is already available at the IAI's website, and you can analyze these results in more detail. First of all, this is a main takeaway. This is one of the main things we say in our chapter when we talk about Central America and also South America, but especially in this case, Central America. The region is highly exposed. It is vulnerable and it is strongly impacted by climate change. This climate change situation affects a pre-existing situation of inequality, poverty, population growth and deforestation. In other words, climate change is exacerbating environmental uh, socioeconomic conditions that already existed before. As Carolina has already said, in group two, we also use the same conceptual framework to define the, the impact risk. And this risk comes from threats, vulnerability, and exposure. Carolina has already talked about the climate-related threats. Now I would like to focus on that as well, but also on exposure and vulnerability. And as I said uh, on this slide, these three variables um, have a strong percentage in Central America. This is why this area is a problem. Climate hazards, this is working group one information. As working group two, we use uh, this information. In the Central and South America, group two, we also present a summary of the impacts and climate dangers that are debated in group one, because that is a base for us to discuss the potential adaptations that can be seen in the region. So, working group one, we see that in Central America, we already have an, uh, an increase in main temperatures and heat waves, as you can see uh, in the map on the left, uh, also uh, cold waves. But the, the drought issue is more van variable depending on the region. There have also been some drought years or uh, heavy rainfall years, so th that's variable as well. Sea levels rising also uh, 
consensus. In the future, and this really worries us, climate uh, threats increase, not just temperature, but also have a look at these circles, fires, droughts. And we can see this in one direction. For the future, we need to remember that droughts will tend to increase in Central America. This is the case because, have a look at the rainfall here in blue, this means that it will decrease. So all the climate models for this region indicate that throughout the century we will have uh, lower rainfall levels, therefore there will be more droughts and wild forests. Sea levels will continue to rise. There will also be an increase in wind uh, speeds. This climate section is connected to exposure. Exposure has to do with how many people that are living in this area in Central America population is increasing. Therefore, exposure increases as well. Central America is also a high vulnerability region, as you can see on the map. This information comes from the summary for decision makers. And this applies everywhere in the world. Which are the vulnerability determinants? Central America actually has most of these determinants. Vulnerability is high then in, uh, in poor areas, in areas that have governance issues, when where they don't have access to uh, basic services and when their livelihoods are sensitive to uh, the weather or the climate. And this means that there are high uh, vulnerability levels. What do I mean by livelihoods affected by the climate? For instance, the situation of um, farmers, their livelihoods depend on rains, for instance. Rains are variable, so that means they are uh, vulnerable as well have a look at the high vulnerability levels in most of the areas evaluated. Uh, for instance, the, f the food systems, water systems, city infrastructure and uh, poor population. And also regarding ecosystems, vulnerability is not very high, but it's high. So this is definitely a high vulnerability region. This means that the impacts observed and projected are relatively high. Here we can see uh, a chart taken from the South American, uh, Central American uh, chapter. Have a look at the impacts observed. Some are still quite small, but will increase in the future. Have a look at the size of the dots. This, this image is very interesting. Have a look at this. Most uh, dot colors are gray. This means that we have low confidence levels not just in the projected levels, but also in the situations observed. And this low confidence level comes from the fact that the Central American region has very low scientific production levels. We have few reports, few published sci scientific papers. So uh, at the IPCC, we need to base our work on published lit literature. Therefore, many of these regions' evaluations um, have a low confidence level, and like other areas, for instance, uh, these two areas of South America on the map, have a look at the darker colors. For these areas, for instance, Santiago de Chile, Buenos Aires, Sao Paulo, these areas really create a lot of scientific knowledge. There are more studies that allow us to provide a higher confidence level. So there is negative feedback here because there are areas that are highly vulnerable, such as Central America, and they do not have the necessary scientific um, production. So they have high uh, uncertainty levels regarding future forecasts. Regarding what we now observe and what is expected for the future, according to the IPCC report, the countries in the region are considered among uh, among the countries with the highest risk in the world. Also, human and economic losses are a problem, changes in water availability, and the increase in food insecurity. These are the main impacts that have to do with climate change. Some examples. 
for instance, uh, have a look at the damage because of caused by the hurricanes, also reduction in water availability because of the uh, the problems with rain I mentioned, zoonotic diseases, vector-borne zoonotic diseases. These diseases depend on temperature and rain, and temperature and rain uh, levels are changing. And also the impact on food uh, security because of uh, a lower rainfall levels. This is expected to get worse in future. This has an impact on the region's income. These are poor countries, developing countries. Uh, poor countries and climate change uh, has a stronger impact on people's incomes. This chart is not included in the IPCC report, but in the report we do discuss the values shown here. I would like to show you that these are ECLAC, ECLAC's data that show us that climate change already has an impact on the region's GDP and this impact is expected to increase even more. The, between 2 and 7 percent for 2010 and the, it can reach up to 14 percent. The region grows at a 3 percent rate. This means that climate change already has a strong impact um, and it's the same figure as the, as the growth rate. So some countries might stop growing economically because of the climate change issues. Um, finally, I would like to say that adaptation is a priority for the region and in this sense the good news is that we have seen an increase in adaptation actions for the region but there are still many barriers, mainly institutional and financial barriers. Adaptation is expensive and we, do, we lack the necessary funds. Many times adaptation policies focus on um, ameliorating the impacts of, of events that have already taken place and we do not address these uh, vulnerability causes, poverty issues, etc. Countries in the region have already received some funds as you can see on the chart. This comes from the money offered by developed countries through the Paris Agreement in 2015. Unfortunately, because of COVID, these funds haven't been uh, provided as, as fully as expected. Also, in most, most countries, except Guatemala and Belize, climate change help funds are mainly um, used for mitigation and not so much to adaptation. Uh, this needs to be changed because adaptation is essential in the region because there are high levels of vulnerability exposure and impacts. So thank you very much. I would like to thank you for your attention and please let me know if you have any questions. Of course you can access the IPCC uh, website in order to access the full reports. Thank you. Thank you very much Edwin for your interesting information. You have provided us with additional information as well. Um, we'd like to ask you questions about towards the end but just a very brief question. Is there information on Cuba? Um, but we'll, we'll ask that for uh, at the end. Dr. Michael is a professor of urban and regional planning at the Department of Geomatics, Engineering and Land Management at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine, Trinidad and Tobago. Her work is dedicated to pivotal interrelated issues such as urban planning, climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, water management, integrated coastal zone planning and sustainable development. She has many publications on climate change adaptation topics in small islands. Professor Maiko is a coordinating lead author She's a coordinator on the small, of the Small Islands chapter at the 6th Assessment Report, Working Group 2. She is also a member of the International Science Council, Future Earth Coasts and the Caribbean Resilience and Recovery Knowledge Network. She has received commissions for expert input from the Inter-American Development Bank 
and the World Bank, uh, the UN, ECLAC, the European Union and several Caribbean governments. So now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Michelle so that she can tell us about her main... Thank you, Merci. Thank you. So, <clears throat> um, let me start by saying that global warming is reaching um, 1.5 degrees Celsius in the near term. If it does get to that point, it will cause unavoidable increases in multiple cl climate hazards, and it will present multiple risks to both ecosystems and humans. So for the Caribbean in particular, that's code red because many of our small islands face an existential threat if global warming rises above the 1.5 degree Celsius. Um, some of the climate change observations and projections that were noted in the IPCC's scientific report found that many communities are already exposed to climate hazards these include rising sea levels, extreme storms, for example, or tropical cyclones, where we are seeing um, a greater magnitude of category 4 and 5 uh, tropical cyclones in the Caribbean. And those will pose challenges in terms of how we can adapt to these changes. Some of the modeling of both temperature and ocean acidification um, impacts on the future climate scenarios suggest that some small islands will in fact experience severe chloral bleaching on an annual basis before 2040. And in a worst case scenario, um, with high carbon emissions exceeding the 1.5, atoll islands could experience annual wave driven flooding over their entire surface by about 2060. The Caribbean and Carolina, in fact, pointed out that we are facing drought risk projections, uh, which indicate severe water resource stress from around 2043 to 2070. Um, so the question is, we have seen these impacts, we are observing them, we project what they will be if carbon emissions continue to rise, and we are in a code red. But the question remains, what can be our adaptation responses to these, um, these sorts of challenges? So there is no single adaptation response, which will provide a complete solution to reducing risks to people, nature, and the economies in the Caribbean. And, and we know this globally as well. But zeroing in on the Caribbean small islands and SIDS in general, we note that they do have rich biodiversity and with climate change, large population reductions and a 100% of island endemics, meaning species found nowhere else on earth, um, that will occur across insular biodiversity hotspots, including our small islands. And they will, in fact, um, those endemics, we will see an extinction of by 2100 if the temperature warms up beyond three degrees Celsius. What are some of the adaptation responses? So there will be a mix of responses and we have seen it through the assessment report from the scientific literature. We are looking at protection, accommodation and retreat. What is happening in terms of ecosystems and biodiversity is that we are using ecosystem-based adaptation. And we will continue to do, use those according to some of the more recent donor reports. Um, they include watershed management currently taking place, reforestation, mangrove replanting, and coral reef restoration. The core benefits include food and nutrition security, water security, and health benefits. Obviously, if we do have reforestation, it will help to uh, mitigate the rapid rate of surface runoff and the consequential flooding. We may be able to store some of that water to cope with the droughts that are expected in the, the dry season. And of course, if we have water storage, we can improve the amount of agricultural production that we um, will undertake over time. And of course, 
um, all of these ecosystems have mental health benefits to all of us in terms of recreational value and so forth. At another level, you do have adaptation taking place in terms of protection. These include engineering measures, such as coastal defenses, of, including seawalls, growings, and so on. If they are not well designed, they can cause damage to those fragile ecosystems I spoke about, like the coral reefs and so on. And at the same time, we need the protection of um, our coastal assets because coastal assets, including all our um, coastal lands, um, are key to our economic sectors, the development of our economy, the um, sustainability of livelihoods and poverty reduction. Looking closely at the marine ecosystems, we already know that the coral reefs are under significant threat. Um, under future climate scenarios, some small islands will experience severe coral bleaching on an annual basis before 2040. And if we can, if we, we tip beyond the 1.5 degrees Celsius, we can see as much as 70 to 90 percent of coral reef globally and including small islands being lost and 99% if we go really beyond the two degrees Celsius um, above the pre-industrial um, averages. So it's code red for some of our ecosystems. Um, in this case, the quarries and the, the damage that occurs from ocean acidification. What we have been doing in terms of not just protection, but accommodation is mangrove replanting. And this is in the case of Trinidad, we are seeing coastal lands being protected. And there is coral reef replanting in the case of Barbados to help restore those ecosystems that have been damaged through um, anthropogenic factors, but will face even more severe challenges. The core benefits of protecting those ecosystems and replanting mangroves, quarries, and so on um, include sustainable livelihoods and fishing and tourism. And these are two sectors that are um, pivotal to Caribbean economies. There are examples of retreat in terms of adaptation measures and where you have the seawalls, um, where the storm surges may be taking place and in the future more um, rapid onset of not just hurricane related storm damage, but also um, the impact of sea level rise. What we're doing is, is retreating be beyond the coast. So the, the diagram here shows obviously when we are moving backward, we're trying to build away from the vulnerable coastline in an effort to save lives, protect economic assets and our infrastructure. So there we are retreating accommodation staying there, but doing some replanting um, along the coast and protection is where you have these um, hard defenses here to protect the um, structures that lie beyond. Cities and human settlements beside our ecosystems are quite vulnerable and have been impacted by sea level rise, heavy precipitation events, such as tropical cyclones, storm surges, and so on. This is worrying for us because as of 2017, an estimated 22 million people in the Caribbean live below sea, six meters in elevation. And that means that we can see impacts on not just coastal settlements, but all our infrastructure. It will affect food and water security, including all our groundwater aquifers, salinization of fresh water resources, our economies and so on. And of course, what's troubling for us is the vulnerable segments of the population who may be in the most hazardous areas in the low elevation coastal zone. Here pictorially, you see Nassau and Trinidad. Um, this is a very flat island, the Bahamas, and, you know, consisting of atoll islands and very, very vulnerable coastlines. And even in the mountainous Caribbean islands, you still have significant amounts of coastal settlement um, along these, the low elevation coastal zones and the mountains far back. So we have to be looking at our geography. What we have been doing in adaptation is we're using mainstreaming um, land use zoning plans, looking at hazard vulnerability, using the building codes which are being revisited 
And in terms of informal settlement upgrading, we are trying to see how best to help the, the low income households cope with vulnerability to climate change. The key message coming out of adaptation is that responses are more effective if you approach them in a, using combined measures and plan, planned ahead rather than waiting for it to actually happen. We have to look at feasibility studies to see which ones will be working and that takes time and more research is um, going to be needed. Mitigation wise, we are still carbon um, dependent on oil, um, but we have been pivoting towards use of solar energy more recently, the use of electric cars, but not scaled up to the level that we would like. But the core benefits of all of these mitigation measures would be clean air, flood risk management and so on. In the end, what I would close by saying is adaptation and mitigation, when combined, hold promise for climate resilient development and the attainment of the sustainable development goals. And I thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias. También para alcanzar los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Of course, your message is so clear and there is this red code in the islands. And we need to remember this because islands are highly vulnerable and we need to uh, work fast. Now we will have the final presentation. I will now play uh, uh, the video prepared by Ramon Pich Madruga, who will not be here, unfortunately, but he has sent us his presentation. And then we can talk about, you know, these urgencies, these um, information barriers we have regarding the, the major actions being taken. Edwin's information has been so important regarding this investment in um, mitigation and adaptation in the region. So there are some interesting topics. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Ramon Madruga. Dr. Ramon served as vice chair of the IPCC Working Group 3 on mitigation. Uh, he has been the director of the Center for World Economy Studies in Cuba since 2013, where he has been a researcher and deputy director. He has been an associate professor at the School of Economics at the University of Havana since 2004. He has been a member of a bureau member of the IPCC since 1997. He has a lot of experience on the topic and he knows these long term uh, processes. He was also the co-chair of IPCC Working Group 3 and he was a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Research on Global Change, the, the organizer of this event, and he was elected a member of the Academy of Sciences of Cuba for the period 2012 to 2018. He has a degree in foreign trade economics and he has a master's degree in social sciences and he is a doctor in economics from the National Autonomous University of Mexico. So after this introduction, I would like to uh, play the video so that we can all listen to him. Please go ahead. Okay, let's see if we can play the video now. Maybe someone from support can play the video. Um, the link uh, doesn't seem to be working. I need some help, please. Thank you. Sorry about this, but this sometimes happens. That's why we're here to, for support. Thank you. Okay, can you see my screen now? I am Ramon Pish Madruga. I'm the vice president of working group three of the uh, IPCC. I am also the director of the uh, CIEM in Cuba. I would like to thank the organizer of this event for the 
for this invitation and the possibility to uh, exchange information about the takeaways of the most recent uh, IPCC assessment report, in this case regarding working group three on the mitigation of climate change. So as I had promised, I would like to um, share with you some key takeaways of this cl uh, climate change mitigation report. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to remind you that one of the main takeaways of this latest report is that we're not doing well in order to limit global warming to 1.5 uh, Celsius degrees. Between 2010 and 2019, the annual average of greenhouse gases has reached the highest levels uh, in our history as humans. Of course, this av the average growth of this decade was lower than that of the previous decade, but in absolute terms, it has reached uh, record levels regarding greenhouse gas uh, emissions on an annual basis. There is something positive. There is uh, growing evidence of climate change around the world. And this has this is reflected uh, in different initiatives, laws, policies. Uh, countries have managed to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in order to limit global warming to two Celsius degrees. And also a large number of cities, 826 cities and 103 regions already have zero emission objectives that have been adopted. Regarding the cost of the main mitigation technologies, there is also a positive sign. In some cases, a renewable energy cost has decreased below the cost of fossil fuel. We, there is a strong reduction in the cost of photovoltaic solar energy, wind energy, and also the cost of batteries for passenger electric vehicles. Also, the uh, electricity grids of some countries are already work with renewable energies mainly. Therefore, this type of energy has a good penetration rate around the world, and this is also a positive sign. Another key takeaway or main, main takeaway of the report is that uh, we have this 1.5 objective and this objective would be out of reach unless we reduced greenhouse gas emissions immediately and significantly uh, in every sector. In order to limit global warming to 1.5 Celsius degrees, we would need uh, global greenhouse emissions to peak before 2025, and then they should uh, go down by 43% by 2013 as compared to 2019. Methane emissions should uh, drop by 34% by 2030. Also regarding this uh, objective of limiting global warming to 1.5 Celsius degrees, we would need to reach net zero CO2 emissions uh, by the early 2050s. In order to reach this objective, these net zero CO2 emissions, uh, if we wanted to reach the two uh, de degrees, then this would happen by, would need to happen by 2070. There are options available throughout the sectors that might at least have, have um, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And the report include, includes details for each sector, energy, land use, industry, urban areas, buildings, uh, transport, uh, residential, public sectors, and also, rega also regarding demand and services. The report uh, 
addresses uh, investment gaps regarding climate change and investment, for instance, regarding financial flows. Available funds are three to six times lower than the necessary levels by 2013 in order to limit global warming uh, by 1.5 or 2 Celsius degrees. There is enough global capital and liquidity, but we need to close the investment gaps. And the challenge of closing those gaps is much higher in development countries, given the limited capacities they have. Regarding uh, policies or policy tools, the policy packages that aim for a systemic change tend to be more effective, yield better results than individual policies that address a specific sector or te technology. Also, if we want ambitious and effective mitigation, we need uh, close cooperation uh, between the government and various uh, society stakeholders. Accelerated and uh, equitable climate action is essential for sustainable development. The report uh, goes into detail about this regarding mitigation actions and sustainable development goals. In this sense, uh, the report talks about synergies and the potential conflicts. Have a look at mitigation actions in agriculture and silviculture. There are synergies and also a potential conflict between mitigation actions and the 17 SDGs. Have a look at the uh, at how synergies prevail, where, where you see the positive sign, the plus sign. Uh, in some cases, there is no conflict, and in some other cases, both things happen, synergies and conflicts, and they need to be properly considered in each case. Therefore, we need to pay special attention to this connection between mitigation and sustainable development. Generally speaking, evidence shows, the evidence is very clear in this report, now is the time to act. And this is uh, a message included in the three reports of the three working groups. They agree that action is urgent regarding climate change. We need to act now and we need to act uh, properly regarding climate change. Thank you again to the organizers for inviting me to participate today. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Ramon Pich Madruga, for his presentation. So now we have a message, a clear message of urgency. Let us now go on to the Q&A session. Before we start, I would like to uh, mention three topics that have appeared in, in all the presentations to different extents. Dr. Carolina and Erwin as well, they have talked about the specific inf the specific information gap for the region. There is not enough, people don't trust the results enough because, because we lack studies that can actually determine the specific impacts or that will allow us to know what happens in the region more efficiently. This might this seems to be the case in, in Central America in particular, that, um, and there, are, there seem to be uh, barriers to uh, creating knowledge. That's the first barrier I detect. The second one has to do with investment. There is an imbalance between investment in the region and the topics, and how we can promote uh, more equality and we should also know which are the gaps when it comes to implementing these uh, adaptation and mitigation combined actions. So having said all this, I would like to ask each of you a specific question and please uh, go ahead and give us more information about these three topics that I have mentioned. So first of all, Dr. Carolina, regarding the results, and because we want to 
implement this information and this scientific information many times it's difficult to understand how can we actually uh, get this information to planners to local planners and national planners so how can we let's say what type of climate information is necessary to include it in development plans and adaptation and mitigation actions Dr. Carolina. That's a great question. Um, I, it's great to uh, delve into some important topics. I believe that the scientific and uh, technical community and decision makers have evolved regarding climate change information. Now we can provide um, um, climate information that is accurate, that uh, is trustworthy, but that is also va valuable and um, relevant for the user. The information presented by the IPCC report does not replace the national reports. Also, it doesn't replace the local and subnational planning that needs to be implemented in order to align development plans and climate action plans. So in this sense, the entire Latin America, not just Central America, needs to um, actually analyze its own assessments uh, further, and they need to be aligned with development plans as well. In this region, uh, if we aim to I don't know, uh, develop a specific crop, for instance. The climate information needed needs to be aligned with that use or assessment in particular. And most of all, we shouldn't have a division. We shouldn't have climate change information, development plan information. Decision makers need, um, you know, integral policies. Just a brief comment because Kim asked a relevant question uh, in the Q&A section. She asks about the uh, disciplines and areas we should pay more attention to in order to promote climate action. Actually, there is a need to integrate all disciplines. Every discipline has something to contribute now to uh, uh, climate action and development action agendas. In our continent, researchers, we also need social uh, scientists and humanities experts to participate more actively. We have uh, people that study poverty issues as well, but we need to intersect that with the climate, uh, with the climate area as well. Thank you, Carolina. And yes, of course, interdisciplinarity is important. It's actually essential in this kind of topic. Edwin, in your presentation, you also talked about major um, elements regarding investment, uh, what happens with investment and funds, and you also talked about poverty in Central America. Uh, this probably includes rural uh, communities as well, uh, culturally diverse communities, etc. In this sense, how could we actually uh, take uh, the integrated actions regarding mitigation and adaptation to help those communities? Is there an investment? How can we actually implement all of these actions in that type of setting? Thank you, Mercy, for the question. It is indeed a challenge because, as I was saying, climate change in our region affects a pre-existing critical condition. For instance, there are high levels of food insecurity, high levels of poverty and malnutrition. And on top of that, now we have climate change. So first, it's important to have a comprehensive perspective um, of things. Uh, many. Many times in the whole region or in several countries, climate change is seen as, a, as a, um, an environmental issue. 
that the Ministry of the Environment should address, but it should be addressed as a comprehensive issue and every ministry should participate uh, and have a strategy to address climate change. And more specifically regarding what Mercy is asking regarding how to work with communities, I think it's important to work um, top down and, um, and bottom up as well. Local governments are essential as actually uh, people that can talk to international organizations. Therefore, international funding sources uh, usually go through the central government. One of the adaptation limitations is institutional weakness. What we need is to strengthen our governments so that they can have well-trained teams in order to access these international funds. It's not easy to write a proposal to the uh, uh, Green uh, Climate Fund. It's not easy. Many times we neg negotiations last four or five years. I've, I've participated in this type of process. If a government la lacks the necessary technical support, they will find it very difficult to be successful in the negotiations. Someone asked in the chat or commented this, stronger countries tend to have uh, a better chance of accessing these funds. And you can see this in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a stronger uh, country with the strongest institutionality and they have been more successful. But that's one thing, we need to strengthen governments so that we can work with uh, funds for adaptation, so uh, top down, but also bottom up, because we need to have local implementation, even in small uh, Central American countries, there is high impact variability and also many different um, um, events. In Guatemala, for instance, there are droughts in the mountains and 300 kilometers to the north, uh, on the plains we have uh, floods. So it is a relatively small area and we have uh, immensely different impacts. So me actions need to be local and communities need to participate as well. In this sense, we need to work with uh, uh, people's knowledge as well, especially when it comes to agriculture. Farmers are used to uh, variable weather. They're used to, uh, uh, I don't know, waiting what's going to happen with the rain this year and how I need to adapt or change my plan. So we need to work with local communities. We are not uh, the knowledge bearers, but our, uh, rather our knowledge will complement their knowledge as communities that have been, uh, you know, dealing with this type of uh, climate variability for many years. Also, indigenous knowledge is very important and it's something that the IPCC has uh, highlighted in its most recent report, uh, um, especially this one. This is a ch challenge, how we can integr integrate the indigenous knowledge and they transfer their information in a different way, uh, different from what the IPCC does. Indigenous uh, knowledge is usually based on, um, you know, uh, storytelling and the IPCC works with the written word, but, but the IPCC would really like to include this knowledge when we work with adaptation and mitigation. Indigenous peoples have lived in this region for thousands of years. They have seen changes for thousands of years and they have learned so much. We need to use this knowledge so that mitigation and adaptation actions are more effective. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Dr. Michel, uh, Arturo Ruiz is asking a question and he says, which do you consider are the main adaptation measures or actions in coastal areas? And I would like to add the following. Which, which actions are working and why? Which are the good practices that we can uh, learn from um, that islands are implementing regarding what they're doing, what's being done, which are the reasons. And also I would like to reflect on what Carlos Barbosa said. He talked about inequality and you know this climate justice we uh, addressed because funds tend to uh, be allocated to specific places. But what happens uh, with this 
small islands that suffer this strong impact, but they're so small. So maybe it does. It shouldn't have to do with the size of the island, but, but with the uh, with the with the impact. So, Dr. Michelle, can you tell us a bit more about what happens in your region? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, sure. Sí, thank por you. Um, basically, in terms of coastal adaptation initiatives, we've seen a number of projects that are built around ecosystem-based adaptation. Those um, measures usually take time to um, provide the necessary protection, but they are called soft measures. Um, they are considered less expensive um, and they have proven um, from the scientific literature to work. Uh, where it, where ac urgent action is needed, however, you will find that um, seawalls have been built. And in the case of Barbados, we've seen seawalls being built um, and along some parts of, of coastal villages in the Caribbean, uh, seawalls have been used. So the hard measures depend on the urgency, how severe the problem is and how urgent it is to remedy the problem. The ecosystem-based adaptation measures will take time. Um, we do have coastal um, setback distances we use in some parts of the Caribbean. Um, and we try to enforce those measures as best as possible, but that's for development that actually comes through planning agencies. Um, but of course, as you know, as, as you will um, quite fam are quite familiar with that in Latin America, we do have a high percentage of informal development. And it's that um, constituency of low-income households who may not go through the formal regulatory process that we do need to bring into the catchment to ensure that there is some compliance with the building codes and setback distances to protect lives and to minimize their vulnerability to the various hazards associated with climate change. Um, what I will say is that when it comes to funding, many of the projects are that have been identified tend to be donor driven. So they may not necessarily correlate with what the problem of what the countries want, but what the donor sees as, um, as the projects they are willing to fund. And that's unsustainable. So I think as, as a group, Caribbean states through their bodies like AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, they need to have a much more strengthened negotiating position. To, to articulate that the types of projects that are needed should not be driven strictly from donors. And um, the last point I would make is that while we are talking, households are all taking action to protect themselves. Now, that is worrying because we can see maladaptation. So we need to find ways of integrating decision-making and policy-making so that it has um, it, it is able to minimize the consequences of bad decisions. I think that's very, very critical. Um, and ultimately, in terms of research, I, I think Carolina and Edwin really um, made the point that if we are to go forward in terms of strong negotiations, access to funding, and so on, we have to build a cadre of very competent young professionals and researchers to, to elevate our voices in the international um, funding community to deal with the issues of climate justice. And that brings me to um, barriers in capacities, institutional barriers as well locally in our region and um, nationwide as well some of us from the academia or different areas, we should strengthen these capacities and we should, you know, build these bridges. Because as Dr. Michel is saying, it's the local people that know the needs they have. And many times these funds, you know, have some um, guidelines that maybe do not fully adapt to local needs. Great, thank you. As Dr. Ramon is not here, I would like to go over some of the questions that we have here. And then towards the end, you can uh, share a key message. 
and let us remember the three elements information for planning implementation what works and how do we uh, get things to work and finally and this has to do with the uh, policies that are not fully integrated and it also has to do with institutional capacities okay so a few questions uh, addressed to Edwin. Marta Celedon asks to any panelist exactly that. Can you tell us about some successful uh, experiences where, where, uh, where um, climate action plans have been implemented? Please tell us what has been done and how it has worked. Any of you, please. Thank you. I can start. Regarding successful implementation with communities, in Central America, we have worked with water harvesting, water storage, and irrigation systems as well. As I was saying in my presentation, the food production system, especially with small farmers, has been affected by extreme rain variability. Rain in Central America up until two decades ago was, you know, very much organized. We knew that uh, the rain season would start in May and finish in October, but now it's crazy. It depends on each year. Uh, we used to have a saying, I don't know if you have this saying as well, we, um, I look forward to seeing you as if you were May water, but now not even that saying applies. Farmers have uh, lived through an, uh, uncertain times because of this rain variability. We are getting rain, but it doesn't rain when it should. So we need to harvest that rain, we need to store it, and then we implement irrigation systems. That process is not that expensive, so it doesn't have to do with a funding issue. It's more like a large scale implementation problem. It is relatively easy to implement this for a thousand farmers, but here we're talking about millions of farmers if we consider the whole of Central America. So it's a scaling issue. How do we get these uh, pilot initiatives uh, that have worked, how do we implement them nationwide? Especially, uh, for instance, regarding the dry corridor in Guatemala, uh, together with Honduras, the IDB has been promoting these topics, water harvesting, irrigation systems for, for small farmers, and it has worked well. But in a relatively small area with a relatively small number of farmers, the challenge is then to um, apply this system to more cases. Maybe one of our colleagues would like to say something uh, here as well. I think what Michelle was also very interesting regarding maladaptation. Um, people want to do things, but they don't know how to do so. Uh, Dr. Michelle or Carolina. Um, me gustaría decir que no hay una medida única para uh, utilizar, necesitamos la protección, eh, la, eh, la adaptación del ecosistema, retirarse de la costa, entonces no hay una medida única. Sí tenemos que siempre elegir proyectos uh, que podamos aplicar a, a corto plazo, que sean sostenibles. Y Edwin y yo estuvimos en el grupo de trabajo 4 y conocimos gente y pudimos determinar la viabilidad de cada medida porque no siempre se logra implementar los, los proyectos en su completitud. Vamos a tener una gran brecha de investigación que vamos a tener que subsanar y no solo en América y el Caribe, sino también en otras áreas del mundo, incluida Europa también, que tienen los mismos problemas. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle. I think this is a question addressed to Carolina. 
Elba Escobar. How can we improve the co collective data acquisition in order to improve climate forecast in the region? Which ecosystems require more attention in order to uh, know about carbon storage, um, uh, emission flow, and in which areas should we create stronger capacities? Regarding collective data acquisition, both in forecasts and uh, projections, we need the information collected and compiled. Uh, and this information comes from meteorological services, which are coordinated and integrated through the World Meteorological Organization. These networks, of course, can also always be improved. But there are other environment dimensions that lack that infrastructure. For instance, soil water content, uh, the conditions of vegetation. In most countries, most of our countries, there are no institutions that take these measurements um, on a permanent basis. For instance, underground water. Uh, several climate components are not being measured periodically and consistently. So I would focus on the conditions uh, of the soil and the vegetation. Regarding ecosystems, and this has to do with ecosystem and biodiversity monitoring as well. Um, so Latin America, Central America, uh, the Caribbean, the whole of South America, we have a huge number of, of ecosystems. So each region will have a specific ecosystem. We can say that uh, more fragile systems or vulnerable systems, uh, semi-arid areas maybe, need to be addressed in particular. As droughts uh, are increasing, uh, agricultural and ecological droughts, these are the most vulnerable areas. And also grasslands in semi-arid areas, we have uh, a high um, number of these areas and they're also important regarding carbon capture. And they are very important for sustainable livestock practices and also to protect uh, forests. The, the, the previous report, the Earth, the IPCC's Earth report had already focused on these ecosystems and fragility in particular. Thank you, Carolina. We have a question about diseases and I think that health is essential throughout the region. And we, uh, we shouldn't talk about health as well, uh, human health. There is a question on uh, vector-borne diseases in particular. And in this case, I would like to invite Dr. Anna Stewart. She's not a panelist, but she was also uh, an author that contributed to the adaptation chapter. Anna, can you please tell us about what's happening in the region? Anna has worked throughout the region for many years. She has a vast knowledge of the situation of diseases, implementation, and what is being done in this regard. Anita, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Mercy, and thank you, Edwin, for inviting me to participate in the Central and South America um, chapter and in the health component. As you can see in the Central America and South America chapter, there is already evidence that the increase in the increase in temperature temperatures uh, are affecting climate sensitive diseases and vector borne diseases such as uh, dengue, chikungunya, um, Zika, and we know that there is an optical optimal range for transmission between um, it, within a given range of temperatures. When an area has higher temperature, they enter that optimal range of temperatures, so um, outbreaks are more probable. This has happened already, for instance, in Argentina. As Carolina ha uh, knows, in the last 15 years, we have had um, more frequent 
uh, dengue outbreaks. During the COVID pandemic, there was a co-epidemic and it was under-recorded because it uh, co-occurred with a um, COVID pandemic. So uh, the, this transmission is increasing in the south, in the north as well. And it also, these diseases also are more prevalent in higher areas, for instance, in the Andes, in, in higher areas. And based on future projections, as included in the chapter, we can see how there will be more people at risk of uh, being affected by these future outbreaks. As Edwin has said, there are some knowledge gaps. Um, we suspect that there are other diseases, not just vector-borne diseases, for instance, respiratory diseases, water diseases, uh, heat wave related diseases. Some countries already have an early warning system for heat waves, for instance, but we still need more evidence, um, although we know that, that this is already happening. Thank you. Thank you, Anita, for your comments. And OK, in order to close this uh, amazing debate, I would like to give the floor to each panelist so that they can share a, a, a final message with us. How can we encourage our decision makers to do something about this uh, urgency of actions that need to be implemented in our territory regarding climate change? First, Carolina. Thank you, Mercy. As I was saying before, I would like to clarify this once again. There are many urgent matters in our region. And it is essential for development plans to include climate action. If we have, uh, if we encourage our countries to have develop, development plans that are separate from other plans, things won't work. Our countries have urgent matters to address to promote people's well-being. We need to be creative when it comes to connecting agendas and we also need to help decision makers and this is a problem we have in the region in my country at least uh, we have short-term policies many times they are restricted to um, an administration so we need to facilitate uh, this development uh, but also uh, as intersected with the climate change agenda. Thank you, Carolina. Edwin, I fully agree with Carolina. As I have already said, climate change should not be addressed in isolation. Rather, it should be included within uh, act uh, government actions and ministries. Health is specifically important, as mentioned by Anna. I think that health has been under addressed up to now regard, uh, in connection with climate change. Agriculture has been better addressed, uh, but health and infrastructure are essential areas that need to be intersected with climate change. As Carolina was saying, uh, we need to remember that we are developing countries and we need to think about that development uh, from a resilient, from a climate resilient uh, climate resilience perspective and this kind of development means that we need to consider um, climate variability in our government's plans. Finally, I would like to um, say something regarding Central America. We need to remember that we need to, you know, write down the actions we are taking, adaptation and mitigation actions, and also the problems we detect. The IPCC bases on published information. We cannot um, talk about something that is not published. Um, so I would like to encourage young researchers, our audience as well, please publish your information because when we publish what's happening in Central America and the Caribbean, then we will have better visibility in these reports, especially the seventh report that will start um, next year. Thank you. Dr. Michel. 
Uh, thank you. Um, what I would say is that although we are small islands with small carbon footprints, the impacts and the vulnerability impacts are big, and this vulnerability is severe. It means that we have to have louder voices in the international fora where decisions are being made. Um, you know, at the COP meetings and so on. At the same time, that's at the global on the global front line. At the same time, locally, I think we need to sensitize our policymakers and decision makers that there are some things that can be done domestically. Um, there are a lot of anthropogenic pressures on land development that trigger flooding, and that only help, it's only going to be exacerbated by climate change. So we do need to work hand in hand with mobilizing from the ground level up. And, um, and finally, I think that um, we really need to recruit a new generation of, of young researchers um, who will be mounting the, the message to, to the AR6 platform. And that's my hope that the next generation will take the battle. That was an excellent message. Now to close, I would like to give the floor to Dr. Anna Stewart so that we can close this amazing debate. Thank you, Mercy, Michelle, Carolina, Edwin, Ramon. This information is truly valuable for the region. I am so grateful for your words and for sharing your experiences with us. We'd also uh, like to share the, this event on our social media. We have our colleagues from the focal points of several uh, countries in the region, Colombia, Jamaica, Central America, and others. Thank you for your participation as well. I would like to remind you that on Thursday, we'll have the second part of this event, and you're all invited. This is a similar debate, but focusing on South America. I would also like to say that if you're interested in knowing more about the climate and health interface, I have included in the chat a link to a course we're organizing with PAHO and uh, the Columbia University. It is a climate um, health course for uh, re first responders. It's a five-week course. It's an excellent opportunity to learn from uh, experts from the region. Uh, evidence, current knowledge, and the actions that need to be taken in order to face the climate crisis. Thank you everyone for participating and hopefully we'll see you on Thursday.